You know, J. N. D. Kelly, in this very fine book called Early Christian Doctrines, on page 123 and 124, has some interesting things to say. He says, Pope Zephyrinus, uh, 198 to uh, 217, and Calixtus, 217 to 222, sympathize with the widespread popular reaction against the theories of Hippolytus and Tertullian, which they, the popes, regarded as leading to ditheism, the worship of two gods. Uh, and then J. N. D. Kelly goes on to say, he quotes Zephyrinus concerning his understanding of deity and also Calixtus, and this is what he says that Zephyrinus said, I know only one God, Jesus Christ, and none other who was born and suffered. And then when he was accused of patripassianism, Pope Zephyrinus straightened it out. It is not the father who died, but the son. Clearly, the Pope saw the dual nature of Christ in play here. And then also, Kelly records Pope Calixtus is saying, the father is not one thing and the son another but they are one and the same reality. And that the word was not another alongside the Father. Thirdly, since the Father was a unique divine spirit, Calixtus could speak of him as being identical with the word and even as becoming the one who is incarnate. Hello, friends. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes. Uh, I am Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way, and you are watching Episode 8 of Church History, A Walk from Pentecost to Nicaea. And we are in a very interesting part of our study today where we're going to actually be introducing, now we have referenced these people before, but we're going to be talking about them in more detail, and and I have to talk about them in a group, necessarily, because they interact and relate to one another in such a fashion. We're going to be talking about Paraxis, we're going to be talking about Noetus, and we're going to be talking about uh, Cleomenes, and maybe Sibelius a little bit. Sibelius deserves uh, an episode just to himself. But uh, these three men we're going to be talking about, and we're also going to be talking about Tertullian, and we're going to be talking about Hippolytus, because these men interacted with these monarchians, uh, Paraxis, Noetus, and Cleomenes. And also we're going to be talking about these particular popes of Rome here, uh, Pope Eleutherus and Pope Zephyrinus, uh, uh, Zephyrinus, which I've already mentioned, and Pope Calixtus, which also I have also mentioned. So before we get into this, and, and either, there's just a whole lot here and uh, to talk about, but before we get into it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness, uh, anoint our minds, with your Holy Spirit, that we might perceive your word. Anoint our hearts, that we might with readiness uh, believe your word. And anoint our lips, that we might with clarity and conviction speak your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. Amen and amen. Uh, there's about 70 to 100 of you that are faithfully watching these uh, videos each time that I make one, and uh, I would ask you to help me uh, make this uh, series uh, reach out and encompass more people, because 
there is a uh, famine of truth in the world today, especially when it comes to this segment of church history, from Pentecost to Nicaea. Uh, Christians are kept in the dark, and they are presented the social Trinitarian doctrine as though it was the teachings of the apostles and the teachings of their surrogates and the teachings of the church of the church in the first 300 years up to Nicaea. But that just isn't the case. And we are establishing that as we go along. So to, uh, in this particular episode, <clears throat> we're going to open up. We're talking about Paraxis. And we're going to talk a little bit about Noetus. And uh, I uh, trust that you are watching these videos more than once because I really don't think that anyone can, uh, can absorb the information that I am presenting here with just one exposure. So uh, these videos are a great source of teaching because they are there. Uh, and they are there for you to consult over and over again, and you can share them with whomever you would like to. Now, we're talking about Paraxis. Now, Paraxis, uh, we, we know about him from his arch enemy named uh, Tertullian, and Tertullian definitely we're going to be talking about tonight a little bit, and then we're going to be talking about him more when we address him as an individual. But uh, Tertullian wrote against uh, Paraxis, and that's how that we come to know a little bit about him. And Hippolytus over here, he wrote against Noetus, and that's how come we know a little bit about him. And, and that's really sad because these men, Tertullian and Hippolytus, they were outliers. They were not even part of the main flow of uh, the of the Lord's church. J. and D. Kelly said you might call them freelancers, and that was also the also the case with Justin Martyr. But why is it you might ask? Do we have these men's writings who were not part of the main church? We have their writings, and we don't have the writings of Paraxis and Noetus and Cleomenes, which headed a, a theological school, and Sibelius, uh, and Epigonus, and we don't have their writings. Well, it's because that when uh, the uh, social Trinitarian element in Christianity won out in the 5th century, then all of the writings of these men were destroyed, and uh, because the they did not they wanted to hide the predominance of the modalistic monarchian faith in this part of the church's history so to do that they they destroyed their writings but uh, enough scholarship has been gleaned uh, um, enough scholarship has come to the fore that has gleaned let me say it that way uh, from history uh, the truth concerning these men. And it's that truth that I'm sharing with you in these uh, uh, episodes. So we're going to talk about Paraxis and what we know about him from Tertullian. And, and actually, it is quite a bit. Although the Catholic Encyclopedia warns us of the writings, about the writings of Tertullian and Hippolytus, Tertullian against Paraxis, and Hippolytus against Noetus, the Catholic Encyclopedia warns us against taking uh, what these men, Tertullian and Hippolytus, have to say negatively about their uh, antagonist, because these two men, Tertullian and Hippolytus, were not above uh, fabricating untruths are exaggerating, are accusing their opponents of believing what their opponents did not believe. So we know what modalistic monarchianism is today, 
and we know pretty much what uh, this theology has been throughout the centuries. So when these men's accusations against the modalists uh, go to a, 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 a tenant that we know modalism has never taught, then we know they are uh, misinformed or out and out prevaricating. So let's jump into this and uh, see where we can go with it, all right? Now, Paraxis came to Rome from Asia Minor during the time of Pope uh, Eleutherus, and that was, uh, I think, the, the, the Catholic uh, register of popes have him being uh, receiving the episcopacy there in Rome at 171 as early as 171 AD and 2185. So that's the time. Toward the end of Eleutherus' uh, uh, time in the uh, chair of the bishop there in Rome is when Paraxis came to Rome. And uh, some say, and quite probably it's true, that he was in Rome at the very end of, of Eleutherus' Uh, bishopric and at the very beginning of Pope Victor's bishopric. Now his name means tradesman and at some point in the controversy against him uh, with Tertullian his name came to mean busybody uh, among his distractors. Now one can see how the etymology of the name could morph from tradesman, one who works in the trades, to busybody, busybody, implying one who minds or works in other people's business. Uh, Paraxis had come to Rome before Epigonus, at a date that was before the earliest of Hippolytus's personal recollection. Now, uh, according uh, the, the, the way that we come to that conclusion, is that when Hippolytus is writing against the Monarchians, he doesn't mention Paraxis. And he definitely would have if he had known of Paraxis. So Paraxis came to Rome along about the same time as uh, a man by the name of Theodotus. Now Theodotus uh, was, uh, we're going to talk about him a little bit more later, so we'll just move on from him. Uh, according to Lipsius. Now, during the Episcopate of Eleutherus. Now, he probably resided only a short time in Rome, where he met with absolutely no opposition, and he founded no school in the city. Now, when about 30 years after his sojourn in Rome, the controversy uh, was at its height, uh, in Rome and Carthage against uh, monarchianism and Lagos Christology, Tertullian found himself compelled to enter the list against what he called Patripassianism. Now, the name of uh, Paraxis was almost forgotten by the time that Tertullian brought him up. Tertullian wrote uh, a, uh, a work against Paraxis, but it was not uh, at a contemporary time with Paraxis. Paraxis had been in Carthage 30 years earlier before Tertullian wrote against him. So when Tertullian wrote against him, he wasn't really writing against per Paraxis per se, but he was writing against the Monarchian uh, uh, theology that was at that time in Rome battling uh, Tertullian's buddy, Hippolytus. But Tertullian, however, laid hold on Paraxis because Paraxis had been the first to defend the orthodoxy of the Hebraic Christology against the new Lagos Christology that was establishing itself in Carthage some 30 years prior. Also, because uh, he had a Tertullian had a hostility against Paraxis, who was a decided and outspoken anti-Montanus. Remember, we talked about the Montanists and how Tertullian had become a Montanist, and even there was a branch of Montanism 
that took Tertullian's name. Now, in his attack, Tertullian is, though directing his uh, ire against Paraxis, he's really reviewing the circumstances of about the year 210 when uh, his work uh, against Paraxis was written. Now, he manifestly alludes to the Roman monarchians, namely Pope Zephyrinus and those who were protected by him. Now, Paraxis was a confessor. Uh, one became a conf called a confessor when they were imprisoned for their faith or, or was uh, tortured for their faith. And he was a, professor, a confessor because he had been imprisoned for his faith when he was in Asia Minor, for that's where he came from to Rome. And among the first to bring the dispute, uh, Paraxis was, he was among the first to bring the dispute against Lagos Christology to Rome. And he brought that dispute from Asia Minor. At the same time, he brought forth from his birthplace a resolute zeal against what was called the new prophecy, or Montanism. Now, we are here reminded of the Logoi, and we'll be talking about them a little bit later, too. Now, the Logoi of Asia Minor, uh, who combined their rejection of the Lagos Christology with an aversion to Montanism. Now, the word Logoi just simply means against the Lagos. Not that they were against Christ, but they were against the Lagos Christology, so they were called a Logoi or a Logoi. Uh, not, not only did Paraxis' efforts meet with no opposition in Rome whatsoever, but Paraxis induced the bishop uh, of Rome by uh, giving Paraxis as a confessor because he had been in prison for the faith of Asia Minor uh, and among the first to bring the dispute there, as I have said, against the Lagos Christology of Rome. Uh, and uh, he brought this uh, heated uh, resistance to the new prophecy, uh, that not only did his efforts meet with no opposition in Rome, but uh, Paraxis was successful in convincing the bishop uh, to uh, recall his letter of peace, which had already been sent to the Montanist. Now, let me explain that. It, in this particular time of the church's history, if you were a member of, of one church, then you were a member of all of the churches. And uh, churches like Rome that were large, they would send out letters of peace to other churches throughout uh, the empire, throughout the world. And this letter of peace uh, stated that if anyone from that distant congregation ever traveled into the jurisdiction of the church that issued the letter of peace, then they were afforded every hospitality, lodging, food, whatever they had need of, and they could preach freely within the jurisdiction of the churches that had, the, that had issued the letter of peace. Well, Paraxis was successful in getting the Pope of Rome at the time, who was Eleutherus, and also maybe a little bit later, Victor, to recall that letter of peace that they had sent to the Montanist. And uh, this was, this was earth-shaking for, as far as Tertullian was concerned. Uh, if this bishop was Eleutherus, and that's prob uh, probable from Eusebius' Eusebius's history, volume four, then we have on record here four Roman bishops in succession who declared themselves in favor of modalistic Christology. They're Eutherus, Victor, Zephyrinus, and Calixtus. 
for we learn from pseudo uh, Tertullian that Victor took the part of Paraxis. Now, it is in all events certain that when dynamic monarchianism was was condemned by Victor, it was expelled not by a defender of the Lagos Christology, as many have insinuated uh, that Victor was. No, it was expelled in the interest of modalistic Christology. Now, I, I want to move my uh, my notes aside for just a moment because I want to point out some things here from our uh, from our chart. We're talking about Tertullian's uh, attack on Paraxis, and we're talking about the Pope uh, Eleutherus and also Pope Victor that uh, was convinced by Paraxis to withdraw their uh, letter of fellowship from the Mon Montanists. Now, there's something that uh, we've mentioned, the uh, Alogoi, which was a group of Christians in Asia Minor that were against the Lagos Christology, and many suppose that Paraxis may have been out of their number. We're, we're not so certain about that, but it is definitely very, very possible. But uh, there was one who came to Rome along about the same time as Paraxis, whose name was Theodotus. Now, Theodotus came preaching uh, dynamic monarchianism. Dynamic monarchianism is uh, also called adoptionism. What he taught was that Jesus was born merely of uh, a, na a natural man, although his birth was miraculous, but uh, he was born of Mary as uh, a man. And he wasn't God until his baptism. Now, this was the teaching of Theodotus. He came to Rome during uh, the uh, bishopric of Pope Victor, the same as Paraxis. But uh, Theodotus was expelled. He was excommunicated. He was disfellowshipped by uh, Pope Victor whereas Paraxis was not. Paraxis received no pushback in Rome. He was received very favorably by both bishops, Eleutherus and, and Bishop Victor, and he was successful in getting uh, the bishops to withdraw their letter of peace or fellowship from the Montanist, and also uh, he was influential at doing uh, another thing. And let's go ahead and go back to my notes and we'll pick that up. Now that you've seen the people that we are talking about a little bit here. Um, all right. Uh, the labors of Paraxis, as we've said, did not bring about a controversy in Rome with the Lagos Christology because he predated Hippolytus, who was the first one to actually push the Lagos Christology in Rome. Uh, Paraxis was merely a forerunner of Epigonus, as you'll, you'll see him in the upper part of the chart here, just above Paraxis's name, and uh, Cleomenes. Now, Cleomenes was uh, a man who, in, 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 in consort, with Epigonus, founded a theological school in Rome that Hippolytus railed and raved against because it was teaching mon uh, modalistic monarchianism. It was teaching the ancient and uh, the, uh, the original uh, Christology of the apostles and of the church up until this time. But because Hippolytus was the uh, representative in Rome of Lagos Christology, then he railed against Epigonus and Cleomenes, along with Pope Calixtus and Zephyrinus as well. Uh, with the listing of four uh, modalistic monarchian bishops earlier uh, in, our, in our presentation tonight, uh, one is not to think that these four were an anomaly, for they weren't. 
the fact that Paraxis received no pushback from Pope Eleutherus or Pope Victor indicates that the teaching of this confessor from Asia Minor was the orthodoxy of Rome at the time. And this is what church historians uh, bear out. Now, this shouts aloud, it screams, modalistic monarchianism was the established rule of faith upon Paraxis's arrival at Rome. Now, from Rome, he took himself to Carthage. Now, in Carthage, he's in uh, Tertullian. Some say, uh, pronounce his name a little bit different, but I say Tertullian. Uh, he's in Carthage, that's Tertullian's home, and he strove there against the assumption of any distinction between God and Christ. And then 30 years later, after he's been in Rome and gone, Tertullian seizes on his name and writes his uh, thesis against Paraxis. Re remember, when he's really writing against the bishops of Rome, but he's using Paraxis as a, as a uh, 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 how would you say, as a representative of the faith to keep from actually calling the Roman bishops out by name. Now, according to Tertullian, <clears throat> Paraxis succeeded in doing two works of the devil. And this is what he accused him of in Rome. He did two works of the devil. He had driven out the paraclete, the paraclete's the Holy Spirit, by convincing the Pope to recall Rome's letter of peace that he had sent uh, to the Montanists. Now remember the Montanists, their, their claim was that they were proclaiming the age of the Holy Spirit, the age of the paraclete. Well, uh, when uh, Paraxis succeeded in getting uh, the bishop of Rome to re 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 recall his letter of peace, then Tertullian says he drove out the Holy Spirit. He drove the Holy Spirit out of Rome. <clears throat> Secondly, according to Tertullian, that Paraxis had crucified the Father. Now, by Paraxis driving out the paraclete, we have, we have explained that, but by him uh, uh, crucifying the Father, what uh, Tertullian or Tertullian meant by that was, is that he taught that the Father and Jesus were one and the same. So then when Christ was crucified, he reasoned then that the Father was crucified and he reasoned that Paraxis taught the crucifixion of the Father. But the early monarchians did not teach that the Father was crucified. Remember, Zephyrinus said that uh, there was no difference between the Father and the Son. The Father was uh, incarnated in the Son, but it was not the Father that died. It was the Son that died. So even the early monarchians recognized the dual nature and the distinctions between these two planes of Christ's existence. Now, Tertullian used the word patripassian. Now, patripassian means the father suffered, and it was applied not always correctly to those who taught that the father and Jesus were one and the same. Now, obviously, the teaching of Paraxis was received well at Rome, particularly in the mother church, that was pastored by the popes Eleutherus and Victor. Now, there was another bishop in Rome that was uh, an anti-bishop. He, he didn't get elected to be bishop of the mother church, so in pouting, he took his toys and went over to another sandbox and started a, a, uh, started a competition uh, church, a faction church in Rome, and his name was Hippolytus. Now, he and Tertullians, as I've already said, were companions in the struggle against monarchian uh, orthodoxy. The main church in Rome, the mother church in the time of Tertullian, was pastured by Victor and later by Calixtus, and in between that, Victor and Calixtus was Zephyrinus. Hippolytus pastored a schismatic group of pluralists. 
in the time of Calixtus. When I say pluralist, I mean those who uh, were teaching uh, Lagos Christology, that the Lagos was another person, rational person from the Father, therefore plural God persons. And uh, so Hippolytus, in pastoring this schismatic group, then was against popes Zephyrinus and Pope Calixtus. And uh, what Tertullian and Hippolytus did not tell their readers uh, was that the bishops of Rome during their time, both the time of Tertullian and Hippolytus, were modalistic monarchians. Amen. Now, uh, we're going to move from uh, Tertullian and, uh, and from uh, Paraxis at this point, and we're going to move to Noetus, and we're going to talk a little bit about him. Uh, we have some things to say concerning him that we happen to have learned from his uh, uh, from his nemesis, who was uh, Hippolytus. So if we're going to talk about Noetus, we have to talk about Hippolytus. So we're going to turn our chart just a little bit so that we will be there. And I'll move this chart down so we can get uh, a more favorable screen back. And uh, it'll help you see them and me, as it were. Noetus uh, flourished between 130 and 220 A.D. Now, most of what we know about Noetus, we are told by his nemesis, uh, Hippolytus. He seems to have been born in Smyrna, some say Ephesus, in A.D. Uh, 130. And one tradition has him teaching at Ephesus as late as A.D. 220. That would put him a very old gentleman. Now, the apologist... Uh, they, you know, remember the apologists that were bringing in the, the uh, Lagos Christology. They had found fertile soil in the heathen that had been converted to Christianity. And uh, many religious, uh, many religions, I should say, of the ancient world had a trinity of sort. So this, along with the Lagos concept of Plato and Philo, made the message of the apologist almost irresistible to the people that had a Greek instead of a Hebrew culture. So because of this, many of the monarchian pastors found themselves with congregations that no longer shared the old faith. Remember, J. and D. Kelly said the old faith, the ancient faith, uh, of Christians was one that saw the Father as the, as the Godhead and the Father as incarnated in Christ. But after a while, the congregations begin to take on, take on a different complexion. And monarchian leaders found themselves with congregations that somehow had been uh, accepted the philosophy of Lagos Christology over the Hebraic Christology that had been preached by the apostles. So uh, Noetus, along about 180 AD, is expelled from his church due to his unwillingness to surrender the monarchian faith. Now at the occasion of the meeting with the presbyters of Smyrna, Noetus asked a question that's come down through the ages unanswered. Quote, what evil then am I doing in glorifying Christ? End quote. Uh, now, Noetus left Smyrna and established a school. And we don't really know exactly where. We think it was in Ephesus. It was thought by some that he went to Rome. I don't think so. His disciple Epigonus went to Rome. We do know, however, that this uh, that his disciple did, and we do know that it was in the time of Pope Victor, from 189 to 198. 
Now, following, I'm going to give some uh, exchanges between Noetus and Hippolytus. Now, Hippolytus was the first antipope. He pastored the schismatic church in Rome. The mother church was pastored by the monarchian prelates. Now, Hippolytus is not even in fellowship. He's excommunicated from uh, uh, the Catholic church at this time. Although the Catholics today claim him as their church father, don't let that confuse you. They have rewritten church history. Hippolytus is a schismatic. He is out of fellowship. So he doesn't really have an exchange of letters or a face-to-face -face confrontation with Noetus, but he quotes some things that he says Noetus said. But remember, even the Catholic Encyclopedia today says that we must be careful in taking uh, Hippolytus and Tertullian's remarks against their, their enemies uh, too seriously because these men were very carnal when they attacked their opponents in theology. So this is what, and, and we think that this is pretty much the truth. This is what uh, uh, Hippolytus says, Parax, uh, or Noetus taught. Quote, there exists one and the same being called father and son not one derived from the other, but himself from himself, nominally called father and son, according to the changing of the times, and that this one is he that appeared to the patriarchs and submitted to birth from the virgin and conversed as a man among men on account of his birth that had taken place. He confessed himself to be the son to those who saw him, but to those who could receive it, he did not hide the fact that he was the father. Now, Hippolytus says concerning this, now we have no reason to doubt that Noetus actually did say this or something similar to this, because this is nothing that modalistic monarchians of the ages have not believed. So Hippolytus says, now that Noetus affirms that the Son and the Father are the same, no one is ignorant. In other words, he says that in, in sarcasm. Oh, well, now that Noetus has explained it, now no one is ignorant. We all know that the Father and the Son are the same. Well, of course, Hippolytus didn't believe that because he was bringing, he was a pluralist that was bringing the Lagos Christology uh, in, into the area of Italy and Rome. Uh, but uh, it was a new theory that uh, church historian J. N. D. Kelly said uh, was uh, rejected uh, by by the had a wide rejection by the popular uh, a popular consent of all the people, including the popes of Rome, looked at it as bringing in the teaching of two gods. Then Hippolytus gives us a further statement of Noetus. When indeed, then, the father had been born, he yet was justly styled father. And when it pleased him to undergo generation, having been begotten, he himself became his own son, not another's. Now he puts these words into the mouth of Noetus. I doubt if Noetus says he becomes his own son. Uh, not another's. I th would think rather that that would be Hippolytus's uh, antagonistic conclusion from no uh, Noeta saying that uh, the, the son and the father was the same God person. I, I want to go back to this first statement of Noetus that Hippolytus gives us because there's something I want to unpack here. The very last part where Hippolytus is quoting Noetus, and he says, he confessed himself, Noetus is talking about the father, he confessed himself to be the son to those who saw him, but to those who could receive it, he did not hide the fact that he was the father. Now, if Noetus said this, and he probably did, this is probably a, a true rendition of his teaching, 
this militates against the fabrication, the propaganda of the pluralist that say that modalistic monarchianism taught a sequential modalism, that when uh, God was the Father, he was not the Son or the Holy Spirit. When he became the Son, he was no longer, no longer the Father. And now that he is the Holy Spirit in the church, he's no longer the Son or the Father. Because here, Noetus says, according to his archenemy, who would not say it if it were not true, I'm quite certain, that uh, Jesus confessed himself to be the Son who those who saw him, but to those who could receive it, he did not hide the fact that he was the Father. So according to Noetus, who was a modalistic monarchianism, monarchian, he taught that Jesus at the same time was the Son and the Father. I wanted just to throw that in there for good measure. It's just one more, uh, one more nail in the scaffolding that disproves a sequential modalism. No modalist of history has ever, or of present, has ever taught sequential modalism. It is false propaganda put out by social Trinitarianism. Now, Noeda says, I am under necessity, according to Hippolytus, Noeda says, I am under necessity, since one God is acknowledged, to make that one the subject of suffering. For Christ was God and suffered on account of us, being himself the Father, that he might be able to save us. Hippolytus says, See, brethren, what a rash and aud audacious dogma they have introduced when they say without shame the Father is himself Christ, himself the Son, himself was born, himself suffered, himself raised himself. Now, uh, of course, if, and, and this is a big if, if Hippolytus' quote of Noetus is correct, then the charge of Patripassianism, the Father suffered, uh, is a just one. However, it was intended to be a derogatory accusation and was used by the enemies of modalism during the third and fourth centuries to prejudice the masses. The intention was, and also is still today, to charge modalists with crucifying the Father. Now, I want to drive a, a stake right here. and I, I want to come back to, to this point. Uh, but uh, before I do, I want to point out that uh, in Hippolytus' rendering of what Noetus has taught, what he has said, and when he says that the father suffered, uh, that Hippolytus is not a Trinitarian. Hippolytus does not believe the Athanasian Creed. Hippolytus' theology is subordinationism. So he can accept the fact that the son would suffer, but not the father, because the son is not God in the same sense as is the father. So I can understand how the subordinationist, like Tertullian and Hippolytus, that were not, that they did not believe in three co-equal and co-eternal persons. They believed, and it wasn't even clear whether they even believed that the Holy Spirit was a distinct person, but they believed that the Father and Son were distinct moral persons rational persons, but the Father was the true God, the Son was God only because of his relationship with the Father. So I can, I can sense, and I can understand Hippolytus, Hippolytus being incensed about uh, him thinking anyway that the Monarchians taught that the Father was crucified because the Father was the true God as he is in himself, the Father was the autotheos, but the Son was not. The Son was a, a separate uh, being, if you would, that had been brought uh, into uh, existence uh, just before creation. Uh, but 
for Trinitarians today to take the charge of Patropassianism and to lay that at the feet of modalistic monarchians, even if it were true. It's not true because of the teaching of the dual nature, but even if it were true, is disingenuous, is hypocritical, because modern Trinitarians that believe in social Trinitarianism, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are separate and distinct, co-equal, co-eternal persons, then for them to pretend that they are incensed that the Monarchians would suggest that the Father suffered is hypocritical. It's hypocritical, number one, because uh, why would it be an any more distasteful thing for the Father to suffer than it is for the Son to suffer if they're co-equal and co-eternal? We've often said in debates, when we debate this subject on a popular uh, platform, on a popular level, we often say that the Trinitarians have child abuse in the Godhead, for if the father could have come and suffered, and he didn't, but he sent his son to suffer instead, well, that's child abuse, and it's difficult for me to relate to a God like that when I would not do such a thing to my own son. But you see, uh, Hippolytus and Tertullian, they didn't have that concept of co-equal and co-eternal uh, they saw the son as being subordinate to the father, so they could readily accept the son's suffering. But the idea that the father actually experienced Calvary, that was a little more than their uh, Lagos Christology could stand, a little more than it could take. Now, that's number one. And uh, so if if the father, and, and why was it any more... Uh, uh, horrible for the son, for the father to be crucified than it was for the son to be crucified. So if uh, for Trinitarians to use that argument today, it's hypocritical because you believe, uh, they believe, whoever you are watching this, uh, in the co-equality and co-eternality of, of all three persons. Plus, plus, the teaching of Perichloresis that was developed by the Cappadocian fathers in the fourth century, that each member of the Trinitarian Godhead indwells one another. And it each experiences what the other two experience. And each participates in the ministry and the activity of the other two. Now, that was their smart way, perichloresis, of explaining how what was said of the Father is also said of Jesus. Well, they, And we, as monarchians, say that should prove that they're one and the same uh, individual, but they say, no, it's just the, the perichloresis. They, they, uh, they indwell one another, and they all experience the, the experiences of the other two. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Because if that is true, I don't for one minute believe it, but if that is true, then when the Son of God, when God the Son went to Calvary and suffered on Calvary, so did God the Father and so did God the Holy Ghost. So their doctrine of perichloresis the very nature of the doctrine demands that the Father was crucified. <laughs> oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Now, let's go back. The charge of Patropassianism came from either a lack of understanding of the dual nature on the part of the modalists, such as Noetus, if he did say it, I don't think he said it, I think that uh, Hippolytus just put these words in his mouth, or perhaps it was a willful ignoring of the doctrine 
and I think that's pretty much is it, that uh, perverted the modal or the oneness position of Noetus and also of, of uh, Paraxis. Actually, the early monarchians did not have available to them the vocabulary to articulate the dual nature of Christ. Uh, although uh, uh, Ignatius did in the first decade of, of the second century, and uh, we find Zephyrinus also uh, declaring uh, the, the Son and the Father to be the same, uh, the Jesus and the Father to be the same person, but yet making a difference between the Father and the Son when it came to Calvary and the crucifixion. And uh, so I think that this is a, a misrepresentation of them to say they taught patripassianism, and, and, but yet I also would have to admit that they did not have the vocabulary to articulate the dual nature uh, that they had in the 5th century after the Nestorian controversy. And uh, the Nestorian controversy gave to us a vocabulary by which we can articulate the dual nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, after the Nestorian controversy in AD 431, and also after the Council of Chalcedon in A.D. 451, uh, a vocabulary was available to explain how Jesus could be crucified as man, but not as deity. Now, we see the modern oneness doctrine as the same teaching that was or is called Patripassianism. Uh, and on uh, the uh, uh, Facebook uh, medium, I, I see a, a, a Facebook page called Patripassianism, and those who put that page up really thinks the Father suffered, and so they claim this, and they seem to be real happy with it, but they are unlearned in their theology. Uh, I might point out that the Trinitarian charge of Patripassianism is not a genuine objection because of the two reasons that I just gave uh, uh, a few moments ago of uh, the uh, teaching of uh, parachloreses and also of the, the belief that they are co-equal and uh, uh, co-eternal. Amen. Uh, so other Christian theologians, such as Hilary of Pointier, 315 to 367, and Cyril of Alexandria, who died in 444, further explored and expressed this idea of parachloresis, so it's not just an isolated thing. Uh, and, and they did it in order to, to explain the divine oneness. And then later, John of Damascus in 675, and he died in 449, uh, classical, classically stated it. Uh, saying that the hypostases, the three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, quote, have their being in one another, yet without any coalescence or commingling, end quote. Now, as the idea developed, it included the sense that each hypostasis is contained in the other. Each permeates the other. Each inhabits the others. They are called terminus and coextensive. Eventually, this subtle explanation of the divine oneness came to be called parachloresis, as I have said, and coinherence. It is a very important step toward more deeply articulating how the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost together are one God. End quote. Now, according to the Trinitarian doctrine of parachloresis, or coinherence, when Jesus was crucified as the Son of God, then too was the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, crucified with the Son. <clears throat> so, in the Trinitarian view, unless the statement attributed to John of Damascus 
without any coalescence or commingling is taken that there is no communion between the hypostasis and each did in fact act upon its universe and receive its action from its universe without communicating that action to the other two hypostases in which case then both the modalists and the trinitarian believe the, the believe the same thing and the charge of patripassianism is hypocritical but but that does not seem to be the case alister f mcgrath defines uh, parachloreses in the following manner, quote, the Greek term, which is often found in its Latin sir, uh, version or its English version, mutual interpenetration, translates, translations come into general use in the sixth century. It refers to the manner in which the three persons of the Trinity relate to one another. The concept of parachloreses allows the individuality of the persons to be maintained while insisting that each person shares in the life of the other two. An image often used to express this idea is that of a community of being in which each person, while maintaining its distinctive identity, penetrates the others and is penetrated by them." End quote. Well, there you have it from McGrath, who is still alive today. So uh, that is their concept. That is their idea of the Paracloreses teaching. So far, uh, we can, let me say again, and we're closing here on this. As far as, uh, as Tertullian and as far as Hippolytus is concerned, we can sort of understand how that they could get uh, heated when the monarchians taught that the son and the father was really the same one in different modes of existence because then they could accuse the monarchians of patripassianism that the father suffered but for that accusation to be laid at the feet of modalistic monarchians today is hypocritical because the pluralist camp, the socialist Trinitarians, believe that they are co-equal and co-eternal. Therefore, why is it a more horrible thing that the son would suffer than the father suffer? Now, when people get upset about that, it's, it, it's, it's a sure indication of their hypocrisy. Because they believe, I mean, if it's a true concern, because they believe that uh, the father suffered in the son, and they're okay for the son's suffering, but they're not okay for the father's suffering. So that proves that no matter what they say, no matter how much they quote the Athanasian Creed, they don't quite see the son as being God the same way they see the Father as being God. Otherwise, why would there be a concern that the, fa that the, that the uh, Father would suffer if they allow that the Son would suffer? Well, that shows their hypocrisy. And then the other thing is parachloresis. They believe that all three indwell one another and share in one another's experiences. So when God the Son was crucified, so was God the Father, and so was God the Holy Ghost in their teaching. But not in modalistic monarchians' teaching. We are the ones who hold the integrity that the Father did not suffer. Because in spite of of being accused of being Nestorians, which we won't get to because he's in the fifth century and we're not going there in this series. But Nestorius believed that uh, and taught that that Jesus was in possession of two usia, uh, or two usi, I should say. One was human and one was divine. And he was perfectly human and he was perfectly divine. 
He was in possession of a human will, of a human soul, of a human consciousness. He was in possession of the consciousness of deity. He was in possession of the will of God. So, and, and these two consciousnesses that was in Jesus, he denied that they were two sons of God. He taught that they were but one son of God. But there was no communion. There was no coalescing. There was, there was no commingling between the attributes of the two. They remained separate and distinct. So, friend, the monarchian, taking the Storis's view, which was in spite, again, of what pluralists, pluralists say, Nestorius was vindicated at the Council of Chalcedon when they adopted his view over that of his opponents, the Bishop of Alexandria, who taught uh, uh, one nature in Christ. So Nestorius taught that one nature could act and be acted upon without affecting the alternate nature. This is the view of monarchianism. This is the view of oneness today, that Jesus as man could be crucified and suffer, but that act not be communicated to his deity nature. So the son suffered and died. The, the son of man suffered and died. The son of God, the, the, the deity of Christ, did neither. God bless you, friends. Thank you for being with me. And why? <laughs> right here, I knew it would be this. Right in here, when we get right in this area of, of our study, my, it all begins to just get intense. And uh, the uh, because uh, Lagos Christology is uh, coming on with the philosophers that have come into Christianity, but the monarchians are standing up and pushing back and teaching and preaching against it. And uh, they hold the line. They hold the line, brothers and sisters. They hold the line for their generation. And their names needs to be sounded from our pulpits. Paraxus, Noetus, Cleomenes, Sibelius, and these bishops of Rome, Eleutherus, Zephyrinus, Calixtus, Victor, these names need to be preached over our pulpits so our people know of their heritage. They know of their, uh, their uh, doctrinal genealogy. So that when people say, oh, you just begin at Azusa Street a little over 100 years ago in Los Angeles, California, we can laugh. Ha, 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 ha. And we can shake it off because we know it's just false propaganda. Modalistic monarchianism is the true and the original orthodoxy of the Lord's Church. Until we're together again, I'm Bishop Jerry Hayes, and it's my prayer, beloved. You know, before I do this, I've been asked several times, why do you hold your hand in such a, in such a contorted fashion, in such a way to do the sign of the cross? Well, it's the ancient symbol of the East for Jesus Christ. It's four letters. I with this letter, C with the, with the middle finger, X with the thumb, and the next to the little finger, and then a C with the little finger, I-C-X-C. -C. It stands for Jesus Christ. So when I bless like this, it is to let you know that it is not me giving you a blessing, but your blessing is coming from Jesus Christ. So, beloved, God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, bless you in mind and in body and in soul and in spirit. Amen and amen.